and pray in. So, Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for allowing us to get through um, our work. Um, thank you for allowing us to get to this point, God, where we can um, sit and learn about your word, God, and um, learn about your process of how you develop um, the word for us, oh God. I thank you, oh God, um, for the process, even though it may seem chaotic to us, God, but God, you have everything in control, God. You are a sovereign God. Um, you are a God who has everything in his hands, oh God, so we are not worried and we are not afraid what, of what man may say. Oh God, uh, for you have the final authority, uh, for you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So bless us right now, God, as we um, about to delve into this lesson, um, open up our minds and open up our spirits to hear from you, God. So God, we give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I see um, Wayman hopped on, Miss Bobby hopped on. All right. Got you guys. I think I got everybody so far. Okay, cool. I see. Okay, one more. Let's see, Dale just hopped on. Good evening, Dale. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and hop on. Um, this lesson won't be as long. Um, we're covering a few pages in the book. And um, like I said a little earlier, even though um, this is a very thin book, um, he packs a lot of information on, um, on a few pages. So, I, you know, my technique is that I'm, I'm trying to break it down as much as I can so you all can understand um, what he's talking about. Um, for we know that this book is kind of written at a college level and some things, um, I guess assumptions are made, you know, while reading this book that you know certain information. So I'm just making sure that you all know that information. So when reading this book, um, it's easy, it's easier for you all to understand. So, um, we finally got half th halfway through the book. We looked at the origin of the Bible the last um, about seven weeks or so. We're looking at the Old Testament and New Testament, how that was developed. We looked at canons. We look at interpretation of scripture. We look at various, um, various um, versions of the Bible. We looked at um, different English translations of the Bible as well. Um, and we looked at that, the chart. Um, of various English versions and we talked about some of the versions and um, I didn't give you my personal opinion on what what version is best for you but um, I did give you a chart to look at um, certain certain books or they translate word from word some translate thought from thought so you have to um, I own a couple a lot of them in different categories so I, I really encourage you all just to grab a few of them we did talk about the the dangers of <laughs> NIV and how recently it's in the it's uh it's an article online uh how recently they updated the Bible to um take out a lot of the scriptures that refer to homosexuality. They took it out of the Bible. So it's important when you decide when you um commit to a version of the Bible is um you should do research behind it um to make sure that you know, it's a legit version because a lot of these um, editors, a lot of these um, uh, public uh, publications out there, they have a different agenda and they could be pushing their political views or their religious views on you and you don't even know it. So just um, definitely use discernment while picking um, your version of the Bible to commit to. Um, so this week we are looking um, at the interpretation of the Bible, and we're going to look at two um, two church his, two church ages in history. It's called the Patristic period and the Medieval period. So we're going to look at the interpretation. This is part one of it, and then next week we're going to look at um, look at part two of it. So hope you guys can see my PowerPoint. Yes. Uh, I may I, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, is there any standard that determines whether an organization or group of scholars or whatever can say that they are writing a translation? So for, for example, the NIV example seems to me that you can't say you're translating the Bible anymore if you are just inserting opinion. Right. 
Yeah, so it gets kind of murky nowadays um, as far as picking a, a right translation. Let me go to the chart here that we looked at last week. Um, it's hard. I mean, that's why I encourage you all to definitely do research on, like, if you decide you like how a Bible reads, definitely do research on it um, about the, the authors and their intent and things like that. Because it's out there. Um, we just got to um, do the work and look for them. So it's just, at the end of the day, it's all about using discernment and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you um, to the right translation to use. As you see, there are a lot of English versions out there, and actually there are more versions out there. Like if you look at your Bible app, there are tons more um, translations out there. So it's just a matter of using discernment at the end of the day. And it's just kind of a broad statement, but I think that's just kind of the times that we're living in that people have ulterior motives and things like that. And um, we just got to really be careful out there. So I hope that kind of <laughs> kind of answers your question. I guess what you're basically saying is that you don't believe the standards are really there. No, yeah. Like we talked about yeah. um, last time, the standards that they use to uh, translate scripture and adding in different books and things like that. Um, nowadays, it's a little bit more free. I believe this is just my opinion. Um, I think the standards are a little bit more free uh, due to the fact um, that we live in a society where there's over 30,000 denominations and everybody has their own opinion about things. And um, it's so easy nowadays just to start a new denomination. If you disagree with um, a principle, you can build a denomination or moratorium off that. So it's just, yeah, there's no, there's no really a standard out there no more anymore. I don't believe that's just my personal opinion. So um, if anybody want to chime in their opinion on that, that's a really good question. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay, cool. All right. So um, let's hop in here. Um, like I said, we're looking at interpretation of the Bible, um, patristic and medieval interpretation, part one. So in this class here, um, we're going to learn more about the periods of the church and Bible history beyond the New Testament period. We're learning more about the role of the church um, and, and the role that they played in its impact historically on how we understand what the Bible is saying to us today. Um, so. Um, if you're going to come to a place um, seriously studying God's word, we must acknowledge the fact that there are so many Bibles out there that we just talked about. Instead of looking at how to interpret scriptures, we're going to look at how the church interprets scriptures over the last 2,000 years. So biblical interpretation is called um, hermeneutics. So we are looking at the history of interpretation. Why? Why? Are these periods so important because the early church fathers were able to put together what we have now called the Bible, okay? So um, like I, we're not looking at how to interpret scriptures in this class, the next class, um, Bible study methods. That's the class we're going to look at, how to interpret scripture. Um, and the definition of hermeneutics is the art, the science, and the spiritual act of uh, biblical interpretation. Uh, when we see the word science, we get a little nervous. Then what do you mean by science of interpretation? Basically, science is um, based on based off of rules. So there are rules to, when it comes to hermeneutics. So that's why they use the word science. And after that, there is the word spiritual act so of interpretation. So um, we're going to definitely look at that more in the next class. Okay, so um, in Matthew 28, 19 to 20 says that go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always throughout, uh, always to the, to the very end of the age. So what is the end of the age? 
um, the end of the church age, um, that's what he's talking about, the end of the church age. So um, in our previous classes, we talked about dispensation. And we are currently in the sixth dispensation, um, which is dispensation of grace, correct? So in the dispensation of grace, there are seven church periods, okay? So we're about to get deeper. We're about to go a little deeper. So hold on to your britches. So okay. in seven church periods, um, you have the apostolic period. We talked about that a little bit. That's when the apostles were uh, going out, spreading the gospel in the land. Um, we, then you have the early church fathers. We talked about that. These are the, the followers of the apostles. Um, they were responsible of um, basically canonizing the book and um, the Bible that we have. And also um, they were responsible of a lot of um, principles that we don't see in the Bible um, explicitly, but they talk about it such as the Trinity. Uh, we talked about that on how they were responsible um, for developing the doctrine of Trinity. Um, this this um, class, we're looking at the patristic and medieval period. So this is between 200 and 750 and 750 to the 1500. Now these dates, um, they're, they're rough estimates. People have different um, dates on when these periods started, but they are, they're about around the same period or whatnot. Um, next is the Reformation period. I don't know if you ever heard of Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin, <laughs> Martin Luther, who was the founder of the Reformation movement, um, which really kind of um, sets us up to, you know, where we are today. Um, next is the modern period and then the postmodern. So we are in the postmodern period. So let me show you this chart here. This chart is in your um, in your Dropbox. Um, as you see the top in black, the seven church periods, right? So if you mm -hmm. see in blue, um, the prophetic church periods will be see in Revelation, they um, equate with the church periods, okay? So in Revelation uh, one through three, you'll see the introduction of the church periods and things like that, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, um, Thyatira, Sardis, um, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. You see those and they line up. Like, I, I encourage you, I'm not going to go in depth this class um, and talking about how they line up, but I definitely encourage you all to read about the church periods in Revelation chapters one through three. Um, and, and how, you know, how um, the characteristic of, of each church, for example, we are in the seventh period, Laodicea, and is considered the lukewarm church. And mm -hmm. um, it's um, looking at how, you know, we say one thing, but we do another. We're, we're outside, we claim that we're wealthy, but inside we're spiritually dead. And so it's important to, to really learn about the different periods. And as we go through um, the church periods, you'll be able to see how the prophetic church periods, how they line up together and things like that. So not this class, I'm not going to go in depth this class, but maybe a future class um, where we'll look at those particular church periods, but they're so important. They're so interesting to, to study. So Revelation 1 through 3 is where uh, we talk about is where um, they talk about the, the church periods, okay? Um, let's see here. Oh, yes. Um, in, in this chart, too, I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of small. There's a lot of words on there, but this chart is in your Dropbox as well. Um, this kind of gives you a breakdown of the church church history. Um, like I said, the dates are, are rough. So they have Pentecost on this chart starting at 33 AD. Um, some, pe some people believe that it started in 30 AD. And then you see in parentheses, they said, well, 29 is thought to be the most accurate date. So um, dates kind of fluctuate, but you can see the ballpark of certain events. Um, now on this chart here, you see the burgundy line that's going across. That represents um, the one, the holy Catholic apostolic church. And you remember the word Catholic means universal church. That means mm -hmm. just one church. So technically we are a Catholic church, one body, 
universal church. Catholic is a Greek word that means one. Um, and so you see how it could kind of go straight um, through. And then about 1054 um, AD, that's where the church kind of broke off because there it, it's an event that's called the Great Schism that happened. We're going to talk about that next week and how um, there was some disagreement in in the church and how that kind of broke off and that ha that developed um, the Roman Catholic Church and um, the Orthodox Church. I don't know if you heard in the news. I think it was last year how the Pope went the the okay. So the Pope is over the Roman Catholic Church. So the Rome the Pope went to the Orthodox Church and apologized to the Orthodox Church for the Great Schism. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal in history. So um, I definitely encourage you all to research that and look at that news article um, about the Great Schism and um, how you know he's trying to um, build a bridge between the Orthodox Church and things like that. So I just wanted to throw that out there <clears throat> for you guys. Um, let me see here. So, um, we live in a, um, in the postmodern era. So which started, um, in 18, 1900 to present. So, um, as Bible students or as disciples today, we, we treat, we don't really think about the history of the church and the, and the periods that the church had to go through. We just, you know, think that the, um, the present day now just kind of jumped off scriptures. So now we're just like, we're fo trying to follow scriptures as close as we can, but we're missing some things and um, not considering um, certain things that happen in history. So it's important to really learn about um, the, uh, the evolution of the church and um, what happened throughout the, the time period. So the church approach to biblical inter interpretation has changed throughout history. Um, so we are standing on a lot of stuff that we think um, is, bi is Bible, but we, we come to find out you know, through research and through actually reading the Bible that a lot of it is not biblical. So the question that we have to ask today is how did we even get to this point where we're standing on a lot of dogma, when we're standing on a, a lot of doctrine that's not even lined up in scripture, okay? May so, I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, is the Orthodox um, Church on this chart the same thing as the Greek Orthodox Church? Yes, yes, okay. yep, yes. same, same thing, yep. Yep, so it's the same, yep, so they, that's, um, remember we talked about the different canons, um, their, their version of, of the Bible, they have like 80 something books in their Bible, um, 80, uh, yeah, 87 books in their Bible. So, um, and Roman Catholic has like, uh, about 60 something. So yeah, that's the same, the Greek Orthodox church. Yep. All right. So, um, the, the scripture that we read in Matthew 28, um, uh, about go, go, um, therefore go and make disciples, you know, was made between um, about 30 to 33 AD, and now we are in 2019 AD. <laughs> so we are, so we are looking at how the church managed scriptures throughout um, throughout the ages. So this is important because um, most of us, you know, we 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 know about the Bible um, through only through like acquired knowledge. So acquired knowledge is what someone told me scripture said, like my pastor said that. Acts 238 means this, or my Sunday school teacher says it means this, but we don't really take the time um, nowadays to really read scripture and understand what it means on our own. So that's how we kind of got that saying that, oh, I come, I come to church to get fed. You know, that's where we get that statement from. Um, we were going to look at in history on how um, the control of the, the clergy and how they force people um, not to read the Bible, but they got all of their teaching and all of their interpretations through them only. Now, when you study the history of Catholicism, um, they were allowed, the laity were not allowed to, to own a Bible. 
only leadership, only clergy owned the Bible. And if you were caught reading or having any type of version or anything of a Bible, it's considered capital punishment. So um, it, it's only like, I think uh, uh, the last hundred years that the Catholics were allowed, the laity were allowed to read the Bible. <laughs> last few hundred years, I believe, that they were allowed to read the Bible, okay? Um, so we're looking at the tax of interpretation. So this textbook that we are studying out of is divided into two major sections. We talked about that, the origin of the Bible and the history of interpretation. So we are about to study the history of biblical interpretation. It is one thing to preserve what God said through human vessels originally, but the task of understanding what he meant or what God meant originally and what he means today is a whole different manner. <clears throat> So the church has a responsibility to interpret scriptures with the aid of the Holy Spirit. But the problem is that we're interpreting without training. So many people feel they do, they do not have the right to interpret scripture and it's up to the pastor to interpret the scriptures for us. But that is not so. Most of us have learned the Bible through, like I said, inquired knowledge, whether it was a preacher or a teacher um, telling us what the Bible means. Um, most of our learning has come through um, acquired knowledge. So it is not common that many Bible students find themselves un in uncomfortable territory when it comes to biblical interpretation. So I believe one situation is generally responsible for this uneasiness among God's people today when it comes to biblical interpretation. Coming out of a millennia or, or, or more of Catholicism, let me make sure. Um, yeah, coming out of millennia uh, or more of a Catholicism, even Protestant denominations have maintained the idea of two classes of believers in church, clergy and laity. And we still have that issue today. Clergy is totally um, separate from laity congregation. And those terms are not even biblical. You can't find the word clergy. You can't find the word laity in scripture. And so we, we kind of exalt clergy. They're these holy men, holy women. We call them men, men of God, women of God, things like that. And we feel that they're so holy and right. And, you know, whatever they're saying to us, we, we take as gold rather than um, researching, rather than, you know, approaching them and questioning them about, you know, their teachings and things like that. So if you... Um, were um, caught trying to question the man of God what they're saying, they, they would figure that you're being disrespectful and um, not uh, respecting their teaching things like that. Um, I encourage you all put your um, phones and your devices on mute um, so we won't pick up any background um, sound that's going on. Um, so this classification also carry carry with it the stigma that only the clergy. Um, church hierarchy, usually preachers are responsible for biblical interpretation, while lay persons and non preachers simply rely on the teaching of interpretation. Um, give me one second, you guys. Okay. Um, all right, let me see here. Let me go back where I was at. All right. Uh, Okay, so consequently, the clergy is expected to receive systematic training while the laity is not. So the truth of the matter is that as followers of Jesus Christ, each of us have the same responsibility for interpreting and applying principles of God's words to our lives. It is true that the Bible teaches us that some has been given a spiritual gift of teaching and are therefore called to the ministry of edification, but to the clear expectation in New Testament teaching for all the church is that all believers have the capacity and should therefore be expected to learn deep spiritual truths of God. So there is no, there's no, um, you know, it's not reserved, deep spiritual truths is just not reserved for the preachers and for the apostles and bishops and all that stuff. Like everybody has the privilege, you know, um, through the, the, the shedding of the blood, through our Lord Jesus Christ, everybody has that privilege now to learn deep spiritual truths if you want to go deeper in God, okay? So, um, let me see here. So there is no reading of the Bible without interpretation. 
even if that interpretation is if form, uh, even uh, even if that interpretation is performed in an entirely unselfconscious manner. So you find that quote on uh, page 35 in your book. So don't be alarmed by this reality because truth of the matter is that we must rely on the uh, we must rely on interpretation every day in our lives to communicate with others. At the end of the day, we must be trained to rightly divide the word of truth. So as a teacher, as um, as a teacher of the gospel, my job is to give you the tools and the resources that you can use to interpret scripture correctly. Um, my job is not to tell you what every scripture is saying. So, um, so I, I get all the time people ask like, so what does Acts 238 mean? What is your interpretation of, of tongues? And what is your view on tithe and all that stuff? And they didn't do the proper research on their own. They just wanna know what I think. And then most likely what I think, they're gonna ride on that too, but they don't mm -hmm. understand the reasoning why I ride on a certain belief and so then when you actually read scriptures for yourself, you look at like, what is she talking about? Like, I don't see this in scripture and things like that. So it's important to read scripture for yourself. If you have a question, I mean, we live, we live in a world of Google. So if you, live, if you have a question about things, um, it's important to look it up in scripture, do the proper research. And then you could come, I mean, you could come to any of us, any of the elders, um, and say, hey, I've done research on this. I've looked at this. You know, um, can can I talk to you about it and things like that? Then, of course, I'd be more open to speak rather than you just coming to me with a question and saying, hey, what does it say? And you didn't do the proper um, the proper work to find out what it means. You have the right. We have all these resources. We have everything out here. And my job is just just to give you the resources and the tools so you can use and the rules of interpretation. So when you look at scripture, you can, you, can, um, you can study this at home. You don't have to wait to come to a Wednesday night service or a Thursday night service or Sunday or whatever to hear what the scripture is saying. You know, as long as we have the Holy Spirit that's inside of us, that mm -hmm. is there to lead us and guide us through all truth, then mm -hmm. we cannot fail. But we have to learn how to listen and discern uh, the voice of of the Lord. Okay, so I can't I can't be your Lord. I remember somebody told me, <laughs> someone ah, I need to turn off my inbox. So somebody inboxed me and was like, "Well, I have a question about you know I think I think the Lord is um, telling for me to move to another city." And I told the Lord that I want the answer to come through you, and instead of instead of um, instead of uh, the Lord telling me. So what is the Lord saying for me to move? I said, you need to go back to the Lord. The Lord ain't telling me nothing about you. Right. <laughs> I'm just like, who am I? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out whether I move or not. So what you makes you think I'm concerned about? Okay. I was, I was like, <laughs> I had to type it nicely. Like, no, ma'am, you go mm -hmm. to the same access as I do. That's right. <laughs> to ask the Lord what it is, the will of your life. Like, I can't, I can't help you. Okay. We don't live in, we're not, we don't live in that time. Well, we're not Catholic where you come to a booth and you ask these questions and you confess your sins to me and all that. No, no, I'm not Jesus. I ain't died for you. I didn't shed a blood, nothing. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is, has um, been brought here on earth inside of us. He's our superintendent. He is ruling at this moment here on earth. He is mm -hmm. here to lead us and guide us through all truth, not me. Because if, mm -hmm. if, I, if it was dependent on me, you ain't going to be in no truth. I already know it. So just make sure <laughs> you are leaning. Like, we're here to help you, but we're not here as your ultimate answer or not your standard of answers. Okay. So that's what I'm going to say on that one. All right. Get off my soapbox and get back to the lesson. All right. Uh, <laughs> so in your book, it talks about three basic assumptions of interpretation. So these, these are the rules that they, that they use in order to interpret um, scripture um, in the patristic and medieval ages. Okay. All right, so the first rule 
Okay, before I get to the rule, let me give you a little bit background of the patristic um, period. So like we said, the patristic period um, was between 200 and 750 AD, and the medieval period was between 750 to 1500 AD. So these periods represents the largest stretch in church history, and this, these periods are very important. So from... Do I have these on the slide? No, I don't. Okay, good. So from... Uh, lost my place here. From patristic to medieval history is about 1300 years. So this was 1300 years of organized church. There weren't denominations. There weren't any other options. You had to either be in this one Catholic, one, um, this one church, or you weren't a believer at all. Okay. So this is still kind of a continuation of the building of the church in scripture. So they kind of kept that going for the past about uh, about fifteen hundred years, okay, so mm -hmm. uh, so not so yeah, not the organization church that we know it as far as denomination. So they were focused on doing what the Lord has called for them to do until it kind of got out of hand. So we're going to be looking at that kind of next week on how it got out of hand. So the church used the same standards to interpret the Bible. There were um, there was only, like I said, one church from 30 AD up until 1054 AD until Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant movement, um, who protested the Catholic church. He began to question how church leaders were interpreting scriptures. Um, so that he, pro he protested the church, hence where we got the name Protestant. It is all about protesting what the Catholic church was teaching the people. And you have to remember when you do your research on Martin Luther, he was a bishop. He was a leader in the church. He wasn't just a laity. No, he was a bishop in a church. But something about how they were doing leadership didn't sit right with them. And he posed a question which kind of blew up. It went back to Rome, it went back, you know, to the council, and it just kind of kind of blew up from there. So We'll talk about that a little bit more next week. So, um, so it is important for us to understand the way that theologians approach the Bible today is much different than the way that scholars did during the patristic and medieval periods. So this is primarily true because the three basic assumptions introduced in the previous lesson. So this is the first one. The first assumption is, um, so if you're trying to interpret scripture, these are the three rules that you must use. So there must be harmony uh, between the message of the Old Testament and that of the New Testament, okay? So you can read about that on page 38. So scripture contained messages about which, is hum about which its human authors were only dimly aware, okay? So what in this, past, in this sentence here, he was saying that um, those who wrote scripture, they didn't have the whole big picture like we like we can't like we have now. So we have the complete Bible. So we kind of have the whole picture of what's going on. But the authors that were writing the writing scriptures, they did not have a picture of what was going on. So they only kind of knew in part of what was going on. So whatever you you think the Bible is saying, it has to connect between the Old and New Testament. So there is no such thing as the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. In, the time, in these time periods, no biblical interpretation would be considered sound if you did not connect the Old and New Testament, okay? Because there, there are connections. There's a whole lot of connections of the Old and New Testament. Um, I don't know about you, but during my, my church history or just coming up in church, um, we were really told not to really um, mind ourselves with the Old Testament because they said, oh, it's law. So you're, we're not under law anymore. So there's no reason why you need to be reading or studying the Old Testament because it doesn't pertain to us. And in reality, yes, we're not under law, but a lot of those prophecies, a lot of those stories mm -hmm. connect mm -hmm. with the New Testament and is still being fulfilled today. And mm -hmm. so the next class, the Bible study methods, we're going to look at the levels of interpretation um, and how, you know, it's supposed to be, there's a, there's a um, contemporary interpretation, there's a messianic interpretation, and there's an end time interpretation. And so you have to, in order to, to understand the interpretations, you have to, you have to grab the Bible 
um, each part, you have to grab the old and new scripture and put it together. So we're going to look at that in our next class. So that was that's the first assumption. So the second one is the harmony between the message of the Bible um, and that of the church. So when you look at that, you'd be like, okay, cool. Like, okay, it has to, you know, what you what you think of scripture has to line on what the church is saying. But this right here, it means that Christians did not just believe in divine inspiration of scripture. They also believe in the divine establishment of the church. So during this time, they believe that the interpretation of scripture is only done by clergy. So the division um, inside the church, um, I didn't change that. I see my notes. Oh, shoot. I, du I duplicated the slide, but I forgot to change the information. So just listen. Just follow. Well, just listen. So. Um, <laughs> the division inside the church was done during this time. So because so many questions about the Bible came up, they will hold a council like they did in Acts 15. So I want to, let me see here. I want to ask you all about, can you see my Bible on the screen? No, you probably can't. Hold on. Let me see here. Let me go desktop to, all right. Can you see the Bible now? Yes. Okay, cool. So this is Acts 15. So I know a, a lot of us are aware of the scripture where the certain people, they were sitting, they were talking about Gentiles and how they should be circumcised and things like that. So why, um, this is an open question so anybody can answer. Why do you think they were sitting and talking about um, the importance of Gentiles being circumcised. Because it was a cut their custom. Yep, because it was part of the custom. What else? Mm, wasn't it part of their law? Yes, it was part of the law. It was definitely part of the law, and as a sign that they belong to God. Yes, it was a part of their sign that they belong to God. And then there's one more. Um, so who is at this time, at this time in history, who is the head of the church? It's kind of a trick question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who is the head of the church at this time? When it's the Jews. So if we are if if uh we're the body, who's the head? Jesus, I was I mean, Jesus. <laughs> damn, you said it like he was never the head. That's why I was confused. Like, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah right. I know it was, a trick, it, was a quick, it was a trick question. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm still in the so old testament. We great. Look, <laughs> in the old testament, I'm like <laughs> with the circle. I'm like, I'm like, uh, wait, we're there in church in the old testament. Wait, is this the church? Right, right. I know, I was like, oh, these kids about to, about to bust a, bl a blood vessel trying to. <laughs> I <laughs> know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like <laughs> so because the because church was not these, established yet. Right, but actually, it was. It's Acts 15. So no, we thought you were. We thought you were still in the old, old testament. testament. <laughs> um, yeah, we were That's just true. talking about the old testament, so we thought we were still good. right. Yeah, we're right. talking about That's Acts 15. So I said, at this time, who is yeah, the but, church? But yeah, you're talking but, about circumcision, and that's what made me think we right. went back to, yeah. oh, we're right. going <laughs> So we were still Look at everybody trying thing. to explain their, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was <laughs> Uh -uh. It's all good. I just I knew it when I when I wrote the question down. I said, oh, this is going to be fun. So. Uh, okay, we with you now. We're right. with you. <laughs> so, because Jesus is the head of the church, they their thinking is, well, what Jesus uh, have done, everybody should do. So Jesus was a Jew, and he was circumcised. So therefore, everybody should be circumcised. But then Paul came in and he said, what? What did he say to them? Talk about circumcision of the heart. Right. He's saying, you know, that's not the way to get mm -hmm. to God. Yeah. Oh, yes. 
you know, that was the old way. That was the old, um, the old covenant. Mm -hmm. That was the old way to get to Christ, to get to God is through, you know, these, these laws, circumcision and all this stuff. He was saying, no, the only way in verse 11, he said, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Boom, right there. Amen. And the whole assembly, they became silent. They was like, what? And then he goes, you know, he gives this, um, the words of the prophets. And then he said, it is my judgment, therefore, um, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write, write to them, telling them to abstain from food and all that stuff. So he came in and he changed uh, he didn't really change the, change the standard. He is actually part of God's progressive plan of salvation. And they they didn't understand that the law was, was fulfilled and they're no longer under it. So Paul's um, job was to teach them, hey, under grace, um, if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then they belong to God. Amen. Yep. So um, my point here is that they develop a council because they had a question about scripture. They're like, you know, if, if scripture is saying, and at this time, scripture to them was just the Old Testament. They didn't have any of the New Testament because it was still being written. So they, you know, they're, they're sitting there, they're, they're discussing scripture and a council was developed at this time called the Council of Jerusalem. So when we study history, church history, we are going to look at, let me go back to my presentation, we are going to look at even more councils that were developed, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Oh, my thing is over here now, okay. Uh, the PowerPoint. Let me show you this chart here. I can get my life together real quick. Okay, can you see the chart? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you'll see that a lot more, a lot of uh, more councils were developed um, during this time because, like I said, if if the people had questions about scripture, they will go to bishops and get their interpretation that way. So in scripture, you see where the first council was developed in 49 AD was the council at Jerusalem or whatever. So um, that's kind of kind of how we got to the point of, you know, getting your interpretation from script, from the leaders of the church, whatever. But uh, when we look at Catholicism and, down throughout history, it got twisted. So it was okay to go at that time because of God's progressive plan. It was okay for them to go and get um, interpretation from, you know, your leaders and councils and things like that. But um, Catholicism, they twisted it to the point where um, they, you had to believe in certain things. So like going back to the second one, let me go back to the, the second one of harmony and the church. So if the church at this time, there was no separation of church and state, okay? Church ran everything at this time. They even ran the educational system. So at this time, this council, they believe, not the church, not the council of um, Jerusalem, this time it's like the, um, uh, let me see. The Nicene, the, yeah, the Nicene Council at this time. So the Nicene Council. So at this time here, um, they believed that the earth was flat. So if you taught anything different against what the church, is, church believed, the earth is flat, you could be killed. That's considered capital punishment. That is on grounds to be killed because the earth, because the, the, the church believed that the earth was flat. Um, was they following, was, um, uh, was they following um, the philosophers or the philo philosophical views on the various philosophers because you had one saying the earth was flat. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. 
Yep, yep. So yeah, like you said, you got one saying Earth is flat, one says Earth is round, all this stuff. And right. so they decided, like, hey, we believe that the Earth is flat. So therefore, in your schools and your teaching, you better be teaching about the Earth is flat and things like this that. This is so, why I watch a I watch a lot of things on, um, uh, you know, like I watch a lot of the science stuff, you know, yeah. uh, planets and all that. And every time. I get to watching shows about um, planets and and all these things. It always goes back to the church created the <laughs> educational system. Yeah. And when I remember years ago, first hearing, I was like, "They're lying on us. Why would we create that? Don't even make sense." And then as I go on and I keep hearing it, and I'm like, "And this is why we get and we're the church today, but this is why we get a bad rep." Mm-hmm. for even how they did things back then because it's like oh and for and, and that's how they get oh and for the christians yeah. it was your church that established this and i'm like oh my god like we yeah. Can't win. Yeah. yeah yeah so now you see why um kind of you know the, the quote-unquote christians we get blamed for everything well the I, you know i'm using the word christian like uh loosely or whatever um but when you, like we said, when we, when you study Christianity, when you study that, you see that Christian Christians were murderers, they were liars, they were all types of stuff. They were not the church. <laughs> the church is not built on lies. The church, no, the church is not that or whatever. So, um, as you see throughout history, where kind of where it kind of turned or whatever. So, um, I don't know if you all know, I, I encourage you all to kind of kind of do like a light reading on Catholicism and understand uh, why they believe in purgatory <laughs> and why they believe that you can pay money in order to be forgiven of your sins. So that, that was one thing that Martin Luther um, protest about. He was saying, no, according to Romans 8, all you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'd be saved. And, you, you know, if you confess your sins and uh, unto the Lord, then you'd be forgiven and all this stuff. He was like, it's not about money. And even to this day, if <laughs> when you when you study Catholicism, families pay for for members salvation. So say your uncle died and he was not really in church, you know. Or whatever but if you pay this uh amount of money they guarantee you that your uncle will be in heaven so and this goes on today goes on today so when when martin luther found that out and you know he visited rome and he saw them building you know these giant churches and that's where you get all these little these these huge fancy gothic looking church you know it was millions of dollars to build these churches and it came a lot of that money came from people buying their salvation so you may think like well don't they know that salvation is through jesus christ no because they were they weren't allowed to read scripture so they were told these things that the only way you could be saved or your your family members to be saved or whatever if you paid this amount of money. So yeah, so you just I encourage you all it's, it's out there. They tell they tell it all. Changing of the Sabbath, all that stuff, changing of the times and all that stuff. It's all in history. And so we just kind of since the the church at that time was so powerful, like Wayman said, it just kind of carried throughout history. And so we have this rep of a lot of things that the that the roman catholic at that time um had established during the time so yeah so they 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 also declared that the latin vulgate remember that we talked about that the latin translation of the bible but that bible had a lot of error they declared that to be the you know the the authoritative translation of scripture and if you were caught reading anything else you know you were you were killed um, even now, um, today that they believe that the Pope, um, the, the Pope is an extension of God. So whatever the Pope says, God is saying or whatever. So, um, 
So if, if whatever at that time, so whatever you try to interpret or trying to say scripture is saying, you, um, if it doesn't line up to what the church is saying, then it gets rejected or whatever. So that's that. Um, and the last one, am I running? I don't look at the time. Oh, five minutes. Good. The last one um, is the harmony between sacred and secular knowledge. Okay. This is the one that I was talking about, um, the science and religion. So we might be, temp this is in your book on page, I think page 40, uh, 41. It says, we might be tempted to think that secular religious knowledge, um, science, science and religion, to use our modern distinction, are distinct because they deal with two quite different objects. We might argue, for instance, science deal with the structure and, and um, mechanism of the world, where religion deals with the relationship uh, of that world of God, but for but for the patristic and medieval thinkers, this, this distinction lays elsewhere. So they, um, so if, um, like we just talked about, like if, if the, if they say that the world is flat, if they say certain things about secular knowledge doesn't line up to what they're saying, then it gets rejected or, or whatnot. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of, um, kind of the lesson uh let me end the show here um that's kind of the lesson so i just kind of went through the three um levels of um, interpretation that they use to interpret scripture during the patristic and medieval period so next week we're going to talk about um exegesis and their definition of exegesis i know we hear this all the time people pastors like to use it in their sermons to sound all deep and stuff so it's just a really just interpretation of <laughs> scripture <laughs> you hear you hear it a lot you be like oh i'm exegeting scripture and all that. oh yes and, and, they then don't, had, and then don't even be doing it right and they never <laughs> had proper training on how to exegete the scripture so <laughs> I, I get critical, but my my uh tolerance is um increasing as far as you know dealing with the uh, hearing that and I'm like i don't get frustrated or mad I just be like, oh, okay, bless you, you know. So you're so uh, nice. All right, <laughs> sounds nice. Got the rhyme right, but it's uh, it's all wrong. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. So we're gonna look at that, and then we're gonna continue to look, you know, throughout history on on their interpretation and how we got to where we are today. So any questions or comments or aha moments? I didn't know this or. I just want to be right before the Lord. <laughs> oh my, listen. I, want, I don't want to go before him and he'd be like, you led my people astray because the woe to him who scattered the sheep. I don't want to be the woe to the me. Listen. Okay? That's all I'm saying. No, I, I, was, I was praying one day and I was like, Lord, I understand why <sighs> the judgment for a teacher is <laughs> yep. so high. So, yep. Amen. And I'm like, Lord, you can take this, uh, you can take this call. I don't want this. Like, I'm not, no, because everything I say is going to be held accountable. And even with, with us, in, anything that we're teaching one another, we're going to be held accountable yeah. for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just want to be right for the Lord. I so pray my strength. <laughs> <laughs> pray my Otaba. Pray down in my soul. No, Lord, I'm like, Lord, if I'm wrong, just let me know. I want to be Please tell me. Like, I want to be mad. I won't be in my feelings. If I'm wrong, shut <laughs> me up. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, one, one thing about it, one thing about it is that when your heart is in the right place, yeah. Yeah. what you're trying to do is to do what God has called you to do and do it from a sincere heart, not to trick no one, right. not to yeah. or deceive anyone. Even in the throes of a mistake, he is so merciful, so full yeah. of grace that when you're yeah. trying to do right, hey, you just, just uh, uh, oversee you okay. You, you're going to be all right. <laughs> listen, listen, me, me, me and Elder Camellia often have the conversation of, who Lord has given us so much grace? Like, so ooh, much. You know, I go back and listen. I, I go back and listen to some stuff and I'm going, what? Like, wow, okay, thank God for growth. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. your heart was right. And wow. we yeah. are all a work in progress. Yeah. So we, yeah. we don't know it all. 
And even with what we do know, there's going to be that glimpse of getting something wrong, whether people know it or not. God who knows all things, but the bottom line is, is when you, line. you went to do the will of God from our heart mm -hmm. to help God's people get set free. That's right. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that illumination is is kind of it's cumulative. There's levels to this thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. One time you get a, a a meaning of a scripture, then you look at the scripture again. The Lord show you something completely different, or whatever, or yeah. yeah. on there, or whatnot. So, I encourage you all not to be discouraged um, when when you are reading scripture, and you may not mm -hmm. get, you know, how Wayman may get this interpretation of scripture, and you looking at like I didn't see that, or whatever. Don't be discouraged. Just keep digging. Yeah. Just keep learning keep digging. Um, scripture. Yeah. And so it will be, you know, revealed to you when the Lord decides you are ready to be um, ready to handle that type of illumination. So that's that's where I had to learn. The Lord will reveal in his time Amen. certain interpretations of scripture and things like that. Because uh, you could be at one level. But the Lord's like, no, I'm not ready for you to learn about this yet. So I'm gonna let you learn it at this level. Then once you're ready, I'm gonna reveal it some more. Like it's just right. It's just all it works like that. So just be encouraged. And it's definitely, like taking, it's like taking um, keys to a car and putting it in the hands of a five year old. I, exactly. They, 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 yeah. they, uh, right. they shall grow and mature to become that and be able to do that. But at that point in time, because mm -hmm. of the wisdom and the knowledge that comes with it, you're not ready for it. Right. So he has to grow into that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Grow in grace. Yep. You're just growing. You just keep on growing. So definitely I encourage you all, as long as you stay amongst a community of believers that are trying to help one another out, we're not trying to outshine one another and just show you how much we know or whatever. We're just here trying right. to help you all grow or whatnot. Yep. So all right, let me make sure I got everybody. I have see Miss Eva, Shakai, Daryl, Khalil, Jamal, Wayman, Bobby, Dale, Tanika, uh, Ronis. I, I believe that's Trish when I see Liesa. I think that's Trish. Okay. And Tammy. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Liesa, Liesa online. Right. Liesa, I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> Did you all. say Trish? Yeah. Tell Lee Lee I said hi. Casey, yes. I thought I wrote, I wrote, that's why I was like, why did I write Tanika's name twice? So I must have been trying to write Tracy and wrote Tanika's name twice. Okay. So. Uh, yep, got everybody. So, all right. I uh, thank you all. I'm gonna pray out. Father God, we thank you for this um, day. Thank you for this class, oh God, that you're just allowing us to understand the whole process of um, interpretation, oh God, and that we won't make the same mistakes, oh God, that you will show us the way of how you want us to handle your scripture, oh God. We thank you for grace, oh God, throughout the years um, that we, you know, we thought certain scriptures are supposed to be interpreted this way. Um, but God, um, through your grace, you allowed us to progress. You allowed us, oh God, to continue to, to dig in your word, oh God, and show us the right way, Father. So God, I pray for each individual during their study time, during their quiet time, that um, the tools that we are giving to them, God, will be used, oh God, to um, look at scripture and allow that word to just reign in their hearts, oh God. We thank you for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that is um, here to coach us, that is here to lead us and guide us through all truth, oh God. Thank you, God, for allowing the Holy Spirit to be the superintendent of our lives right now, God. So God, we thank you and we give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, you all. You guys have a good, good night. night. Have a good Thank night. Thank you. Everybody. Good night. Tomorrow. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> <laughs>